to the Sofa Sports Podcast, now known as Sofa Sports Media. This is our Premier League segment, and we're going to be talking about a whole range of subjects. We are streaming live on YouTube, on Facebook, and Twitter. We are everywhere this evening. There's a cat, a random cat has just walked into my uh, man cave. Have you seen that? Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. How the hell has that happened? Look, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> and you're anyway. been in there a while. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to business. My guest this evening, uh Simon Alavi, you'll see in the top right hand corner of the screen. Uh Alavi, let's uh, zoom in on those muscles. Go and give us a flex, mate. Give us a flex. There we go. <laughs> How you doing, mate? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. In the bottom left hand corner, we have Dan DeLuca. Unfortunately, we can't see him this evening, but it's probably for the best. Uh, Dan, how you doing, mate? Yeah, very good. I'll ease the viewers in gently with pictures of my face, if I'm honest. <laughs> good stuff. And on the bottom right-hand corner, we're joined by Harry DeCosimo, football writer and Newcastle United fan. How are you, my friend? I'm good, thanks, uh, Harry. Thanks for having me back on. Always a pleasure, mate. The pleasure is all ours. Now, we're going to start uh, with Newcastle United. Steve Bruce has taken the reins uh, up on Tyneside, uh, this man, Rafa Benitez, recently uh, walked away from the job. Harry, how do you feel about that? How did you feel when the news initially broke in and where did Newcastle United go from here? Um, how do I feel about that? Uh, I still don't feel great about it. I don't think anybody who supports Newcastle or covers Newcastle um, will be happy about it because uh, Rafa Benitez meant hope for Newcastle fans, everything was th there was always the idea that whatever happened, everything would be okay because Rafa Benitez was in charge uh, during games and things like that. Tactically, he was on the, when, with with Rafa on the sidelines. You knew that Newcastle weren't out of many games, and certainly they wouldn't be on the end of many hidings or anything like that. Um, in terms of how I found out the news, how I felt at the time, and how shocked I was. Um, by the time it happened, I wasn't shocked at all because it had been mooted that these things were going to happen and. People had written things, and and you know everyone knew what 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 was by the time he left. Um, but across the summer, I was convinced he was going to stay, just because he he made it clear, at least to the to, to the press pack in the northeast, that he was keen to stay. Um, he shunned a lot of decent i decent job opportunities earlier in the summer, um, because he because he believed he was going to stay. Um, and then, to, and then, but the last couple of weeks that when it happened, um, nobody was surprised at all because there'd been so much, so little from the club, if you like, in terms of um, anything really on Benitez's future, on the post takeover, on on literally anything from the club. There was, you know, it got to the point where everyone was just um, was just not ex wasn't expecting anything from it, from them. It was just absolute a wall of silence, and that was and that was never going to be a good sign. Um, and Newcastle, where they go from here is, is uh, I, I, I dread to think really, I think the best Newcastle can hope for this season is probably survival, which in itself is a, is a reason for Newcastle fans, not only to just panic and or, or get concerned about enjoying the season, but also think twice about whether they want to enjoy endure it again, because it's been that long that, that Newcastle have had anything to sort of grab any hope on, and they always... And as I said to you before, Rafa Benitez was the reason why they had any hope over the last three years. Now he's gone. Um, it, it does, you know, a lot of fans are, are going to start voting with their feet and you can't really blame them for that, to be honest. Absolutely. And this man has taken over Steve Bruce. Look at that nose. Real boxer's nose, isn't it? Uh, Alavi, you're a boxing man. What did you <laughs> think when you heard about Steve Bruce taking the reins? I mean, I was... To say I was uninspired would be an understatement. And I'm not even a Newcastle fan, but I mean, that for me, yeah. it just felt like a shocking appointment. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's an underwhelming appointment, isn't it? I think, I do think we were talking off air and Newcastle have been spoilt with Rafa. Um, you know, we were saying he's probably the, the, the manager who has been at a club who maybe just, you know, but don't deserve him, if I'm completely honest, to, to work under those circumstances. But in terms of, you know, your question about Bruce positives very little he's worked under difficult circumstances at Villa I'll give him that but what they need is a Benitez all over again they need an, you know a, a pragmatic manager someone but they don't want necessarily care that he's managed Sunderland they don't care that he doesn't play 
the best football, but they care the, about facts like Bruce signed 42 players of, at Hull and none of them are still there. You know, he, his record is average at best. He, he's, he's a yes man. That's all it is. He's going to be a yes man. And you have to worry about anyone who is willing to work for Mike Ashley so easily. Um, oh, the thing is, though, the Cosimo, it's just, it's a fact now. That's the thing about football. Like, it's an inextricable fact. Like, he's your manager. So until he gets sacked and he's favourite to be sacked, you do just sort of have to deal with it. Like, I don't understand these clubs that just protest and protest. Like, okay, it's done now. Do you know what I mean? Like, now you've got to give him 10 games or 15 games or whatever it might be. It's annoying. And Benitez was way too good for Newcastle. And Perez letting him go for 30 million was, for me, bad business. But Bruce is, the, is not the man. And, and like I said earlier, you know, there's a reason he's favourite to be sacked first in the Premier League. Oh, absolutely. Just before I come to you, DDL, bear with me one second. We've got some questions coming in from some of our viewers watching on uh, Periscope. Uh, is this on YouTube? It is, mate. If you type in Sofa Sports Media, you will find our YouTube channel there and you can watch this live there. I know that's a little bit more user friendly than, of course, watching via Twitter. So for anyone uh, watching live who prefers to do that, it is available there now. Uh, that, before we come back to Harry, um, Dan, your thoughts on that appointment? My, my initial thoughts are it was a lot of hassle for Steve Bruce. Um, you know, it was, there was all the to and fro with Sheffield Wednesday and legal discussions, and, and it's Steve Bruce. I get he's a Newcastle guy, but that's the only positive to the appointment. And I think the situation in Newcastle is quite a sad one, if I'm honest, because to some degree, I think Rafa, Rafa leaving could have could have been a positive if they if they then went ahead and got the right man or someone who was going to try and do something. And what I mean by that is, actually, Newcastle have been in the same position for three years now. Um, Rafa guaranteed keeping them up with the resources he had. Um, but that was the best that was ever going to happen. So for a club like Newcastle, just to accept that for another season is not a great position. So they're not going to get a better manager than Rafa Benitez, but sometimes, you, you know, shaking things up can work in your favour. We've seen it before. But then to go and get Steve Bruce, who's like one of the old boys clubs of the Premier League, you know, the Pardew, Steve Bruce, uh, Mark Hughes, all these managers who were past their sell-by date, in my opinion. And to bring in one of those guys, as they have done, it, it's just, it's not a step forward at all. It's like they've, they're, they're accepting the position they're in and they've got worse tools to do the job. Um, obviously, Ayuzi Perez has left the club as well. Um, so... I know, I think it was a, Harry will correct me, but I think it was a release clause, but it was a, a relatively low fee in today's market for a player I've rated quite highly for two or three seasons now. And it's just, at the moment, it's a stagnant football club. Um, all the takeover talk hasn't helped because it gets fans' hopes up, it's getting people excited. We're seeing, you know, Jose Mourinho, favourite to take the job. And like, I don't know, I can't remember who it was, someone like Alan Kerbishley, second favourite, which pretty much summed up the situation at Newcastle. Like, the entire future of the club balanced on whether this takeover is going to happen or not. And it hasn't. Rafa Benitez is obviously, he, he's walked ultimately. He, you know, he deserved a bit more from the club, a bit more from Mike Ashley. He he took the club down in his eight game loan spell, didn't he? And he stayed with him in the championship. We're talking about, in my opinion, a top 10 manager in the world. And he stayed loyal to Newcastle and got them back up, kept them up another season, another two seasons. And to not back him after that, and give him something more to work with is criminal. And it's it's a little wonder that Newcastle fans are at the end of their tether, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, Harry, let's come back to you. Uh, your initial thoughts on the Steve Bruce appointment, and then we've got some questions coming in live uh, from some of our listeners and viewers, and I'm going to put them to you, Harry. So, uh, first of all, your thoughts on Steve Bruce. We've sp spoken about Benitez, the fact that it's a huge loss to the club, but where do you stand on Steve Bruce? Are you behind him? Steve Bruce isn't the problem. Steve Bruce is a symptom of the problem, which is Mike Ashley. Um, that's what a lot of Newcastle, I know Newcastle fans will point out and say, by taking the job, he's become part of the problem, but um, because he's working for Ashley. But in, in reality, he's not the problem. Whoever replaced Benitez, even if Benitez had stayed to a degree, the, the lack of ambition that Newcastle show, the lack of any uh, you know positive plan, anything that suggests that the club could be anything more than just a club in the bottom half of the league, 
is 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 the reason why Newcastle fans are protesting. It's not because of um, because of Steve Bruce. I agree with a lot of what the guys are saying, but the, the reality is that this is a club that doesn't that just doesn't want to be a football club anymore. Mike Ashley wants it to be, um, you know, everything uh, a shoehorn towards his his other businesses, namely Sports Direct. Um, so for a lot of Newcastle fans, they, they sort of view it as, as almost supporting a billboard now. So, you know, is it worth it from their point of view um, really going in and, 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 and supporting the club? So, it, so Bruce isn't the problem. In terms of Bruce, he, he uh, I find it personally, I wrote an article about this last week saying, it's, I find it insulting that the club and people are saying that, that it's a positive that he's a local lad because that sort of, feeds the stereotype that Newcastle fans only want local people or people that they identify with immediately as, as in charge of their club. No, they want talented people. So the fact that Bruce is a jolly, in, in effect, it doesn't work for him, but it doesn't work against him. The fact that he managed Sunderland certainly doesn't work against him. The, the problem is he doesn't have a, re a good record. The, I think what you need to look at, sum it, to sum it up shortly before, before you ask these questions, is that would... If, if Eddie Howe somehow loses a job at Bournemouth or Sean Dice loses his job at Burnley next season, if Steve Bruce is available, would he be in the running? And the answer is probably no. And that's why you have to look at why Steve Bruce is such a, such a not only an underwhelming uh, appointment, but quite a bad appointment in reality. Um, he'll get a chance because, because you know, he'll, he'll get, you know, because Newcastle fans can't, you know, get him out of the, out of the job. Um, because they're and they're not and as I say they're not aiming their protests at him necessarily. He's just a symptom, but he's not the right man. Uh, Benitez was the right man, but again, uh, what, what DDO was saying is, is exactly right. If if they went and got somebody like a, a Vieira or an Arteta or somebody who who is quite exciting and worth um, worth getting behind in the eyes of the fans, then that might have papered over some of the cracks that are, that have developed over the last few weeks. But the reality is that these people probably were on the list. In fact, I know they were on the list. I know that Steve Bruce was 10th or 11th choice uh, to, to take the job. But the reality is that those people will sit down and talk to Lee Charnley, the managing director, Mike Ashley, and, and hear their view for the, their vision for the club and go, that's just not for me. But what, you know, what's the point? In, in, and if they're thinking that, then why should fans stick around? That's, that's the, the kind of the overall picture that we're looking at at Newcastle. He, he made an appointment, he appointed a manager that wouldn't need any backing. That, that's the bottom line. If he brought in one of these progressive young managers from the continent, they would have wanted more money than Steve Bruce would want. Steve Bruce will sit there and accept it because he's delighted to be managing his hometown club. He feels it's the biggest club Steve Bruce has ever managed or ever will manage by a country mile. And he's just delighted for another shot of the Premier League. He's not going to knock on Ashley's door saying, I want this this many pounds, that many pounds. And Ashley's completely bottled it with the appointment because he yeah. knows. He's a yes he, man. He's a yes man. He's not going to have to shell out the cash. I think That's also, it. like, really quickly, uh, oh, well, I don't know, Harry, Harry De Cosmo will tell me um, whether I'm correct or not. But if Newcastle, a side like Newcastle are going to, you know, go down or say not do very well, there's at least you'll accept it if it's done with a certain style. So take Fulham, for example, last season. Yeah, they went down. But you know what? Like, they gave it a go. Like, there was a style about them. And one of those managers, like an Arteta Vieira, they might, they might not survive. They might finish 15th. It might be a totally, you know, uh, underwhelming, uh, not very good season. But there'll be a style that the fans sort of think, do you know what? Like, I could see something in the future. I could see what's happening. With Steve Bruce, this. if you go, yeah, yeah. With Steve Bruce, if Newcastle go down, you know exactly how they're going to go down. Do you see what I mean, style wise And the, that's key. The, the crucial thing that you've mentioned there, and that is true, is the fact that it's it's more to do with just the, the club's identity. If the club, if if, the, if if Newcastle as a city and the fans and everything, uh, and the community believe that the club is doing their best for them, whether their best was 18th in the Premier League, that's what matters. It's the fact that Mike Ashley is quite clearly flying in the face of that and and is is you know just to put it into perspective not only is Rafa Benitez left this summer um which you know and as I mentioned the only the only man giving them hope um they've also got uh, a more expensive season ticket and the most expensive uh replica shirt in the entire division so basically what Mike Ashley's going saying is here's the worst product pay more for it 
and Newcastle fans aren't aren't going to go for that because what because if that was any other walk of life, nobody would do that. So you can completely understand their thing, and and you are right because the reason why, and I know everyone you know it's a stereotype that Newcastle fans hark back to the Kevin Keegan years. The reason why Kevin Keegan is so revered at Newcastle is because in 1992 when he walked through the door, he said, "I'm going to give the club back to the people," and that's what. That's what needs to happen now, and, and and it's never going to happen under Mike Ashley. Somebody's got to come in and buy that club and give it back to the people. And the and the reason why everything was was so okay, or has been so relatively, you know, going quite smoothly over the last three years, is because Rafinha has came in and became somebody who wanted to give it back to the people. Steve Bruce, despite being a joy, that it's almost like you know, it's something. It's a mask to hide behind for Steve Bruce that he's a joy because that'll be. You know, when everyone questions him and say, "Well, I'm a jolly, so I still, so I do care," but in reality, as you said, he's not going to knock on the door and do everything that that, that, that Rafa Benitez did. Rafa Benitez was a thorn in the side of my country, and that's exactly what Newcastle fans needed him to be. And um, without that, then um, then it's it's back to what to what it was before, and and what it was before was two relegations. Uh, when there was a, a you know that's two relegations. There was only a previous. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head how many relegations were before that, but um, the, you Not know, he's, <laughs> yeah, he, yes, it's, it's certainly in single figures. I can't remember the, the exact number now, but um, you know, that that's the reality of what Mike Ashley's done to Newcastle United. If he's absolutely stripped it bare, not only of assets, as you've said, with, with Perez and, that, and gone years, Andy Carroll and everything like that, and, and everything like Sean Longstaff potentially this summer. But also in terms of like absolutely anything to grab onto, there is nothing for Newcastle fans to think about this summer and go, yeah, this is this is what we're going to get behind this year. Because even if they think is the club working for us, then the 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 the, the evidence suggests it isn't. And if they if they want to even go and watch the games, then they, it's going to cost them more. If they want to wear the shirt, it's going to cost them more. So um, you know, Steve Bruce is a is a is a very poor appointment. But again, that's just one of the symptoms and and the wider problem. Are so deep rooted that only a change of ownership will, will deal with them. Great points there, Harry. Great points. We've got some questions coming in, which I'm going to uh, put across uh, to you. This first one comes from uh, Farrell Lee 2019. I'm assuming his name's Lee Farrell. How you doing, mate? Uh, quick question Could Steve Bruce get the best out of John Joe Shelby again, Harry, on this one? That's a very good question because um, Raph Nitter certainly didn't. Raph Nitter is kind of given up on on, on Shelby. Um, he, he didn't rate his, his attitude. He didn't rate the lack of upset, as you've said it. And um, I Paris think that, gone, yes. put across. And I think that um and I think that, you know, he said after the game against West Ham the other day, um that that the change has been good for him. So if anyone, you know, not necessarily being Steve Bruce, but if it, it, you know if, if any, a fresh start was what John Joe Shelby needed. Um and with Diame going, um, Isaac Hayden linked with an exit, and and you know not very many concrete signings or you know not much going in the way. Newcastle will need him to be to be good, to be you know focused and everything like that. He showed why he's so impressive in that friendly against West Ham the other day. Um, yeah. So you know it's it's going to be something that's going to be needed, and I think Steve Bruce specifically. I don't think it's it's that deep. I just think anybody other than Rafa Benitez, anybody to come in and give him a fresh start would have would have faced up with this very talented player, but, you know, a bit of an enigma in terms of consistency. Here's another one for you, Harry. Uh, a couple of other comments uh, coming through from AFC Wasty. Hi, lads. Great show. Thank you very much, mate, for tuning in. Um, 95 Winston says, I'm surprised Rafa put up with it so long. And then he goes on to ask, how much tra how much transfer budget has Mike Ashley given Steve Bruce? Do we know anything about that, Harry? Are we uh, only speculating or... Yep, he's been given exactly what Rafa was given, um, £60 million plus player sales, so that's you're looking at £90 million now, but money was never, contrary to reports and beliefs, and Rafa actually told me this face-to-face -face last season when I asked him directly about, um, he, actually, I, I, he actually didn't answer the question I actually directly asked him, but he said, basically, that he can win trophies while not having the biggest budget. As he did at Napoli, you know, six million pounds he spent on Kalidou Koulibaly, who's linked with a ninety million pound move this year. Kalia Hon, uh, Dries Mertens, all these players he bought for pretty much very, you know, very little money, and he wanted 
Um, but 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 he had the freedom to do what he wanted with it, and that's not that was the bigger issue. So sixty million pounds, I was convinced that he would he would take that and be quite happy with it relatively if he could go and spend it on somebody like Salomon Rondo. So Steve Bruce has got exactly that same amount of money, but he'll have to be buying the players that have been put to him by the head of recruitment, Steve Nixon, uh, Lee Charnley, and whoever the club wants him to buy rather than Rafa wants him to buy, because Rafa was uh, in full in full control of um, inns, certainly, potentially not outs, but certainly inns um, for three years. Uh, he got he got what he wanted just with very little money, but... Um, Apart from if they were under under the age of tw- over the age of twenty six, which is why he couldn't end up buying Rondon. But uh, yeah, Steve Bruce has got about sixty million pounds plus any player sales, which adding the, uh, the Perez deal, there is a bit of confusion as to whether he'll get thirty million on top of the sixty million because Perez the Perez deal is um is, is it could be in, paid in installments. But yeah, it's, it's basically about sixty million pounds as a base, and then anything on top of that. Cool. Uh, Alavi, I'm going to put this question to you because I know you're a big fan. This one comes from Stell over at Shoot the Defence. Massive shout out to him. Uh, big thanks for tuning in, mate. And if you haven't already, uh, visit Stell's podcast, Shoot the Defence. Here's his question for you, Mr. Alavi. Who wins Love Island? Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you look yeah, like a Love you, Island kind of guy. You know, <laughs> you know that I don't watch it. Um, obviously, my wife's upstairs watching it, and she's but she has just texted me saying, "I can see you're live on Facebook. If I'm watching, does that mean that they can see me?" Um, <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> not quite. Not quite. It sure. doesn't. Um, it doesn't. Harry, the only person here that watches that show is you, so you're the one who can answer that. Absolutely, don't know what you're talking about, but I think Tommy and Molly are going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely never watched it, but um, I know that a boxer's someone's boxer's. Tommy brothers Fury, in it. Tommy he's Fury, in it. Oh, Tyson okay. Fury's brother, isn't it? it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a bit of a ladies' man. Nothing like his brother. But uh, <laughs> anyway, let's move on. I'm going to start with Dan DeLuca on this one because he's been a little bit quiet this evening. Uh, Manchester What's United, Maguire in, Lukaku out. That's what looks like it's is going to happen at Manchester United this summer. First of all, DeLuca, the amount of money that's being quoted for Maguire is absolutely crazy, in my opinion. And would you sell Romelu Lukaku if you were in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's position? Yeah, I, I would. I would. It's weird because if you look at his goals records, you know, statistically, you know, he stacks up as a striker. But unfortunately, Man United have spent too many years away from the top. Solskjaer's not going to have that long. He can't afford to have strikers who go on eight-game goal, goal droughts. And, you know, he has to chase his first touch up the M62 and, and stuff like that. So I think, I think Lukaku has to go. There are some good young strikers there already at the club who, you know, who can do a good job. You know, they might not be the best strikers in the world, like, you know, Rashford, but, you know, he, he, he's, he's decent. Martial, when he gets a run of games, he can, he can do some good stuff. I would prefer, you know, if I was a manager and I was, you know, and I, I needed to gamble on someone, Lukaku would be bottom of those three for me. So Lukaku... You know, he, he's a weird player. I don't think he's a terrible player. He, he seems to play his best. He seems to play his best more as like a number ten than a number nine. When you know he comes back, holds the ball up. He's had some some great games when he's got someone close to him. Didn't really work out for him at Manchester United. Um, uh, you know, he's not what I would call you know a top top league winning striker. And that's where Manchester United clearly want to be. I know Solskjaer has said, you know, we're not ready to win the league yet. But he's also said we need to be aiming for higher than the top four. So you know, there's mixed messages there. But for me, Lukaku is is not is not at what I call historical Manchester United standards. But then so neither that, is Rashford, is he? So what no, he's first n- ever season Rashford gets injured. No, he's not, and, and, and you're right. But at least with at least with Rashford, you know, an academy product, rightly or wrongly, does get a little bit more time and a little bit more leeway. And, and actually. You know, Manchester United, again, they, they have a history of bringing players through their academy and, 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 and working well. So you've got a player with a lot of potential there. I know, you know, I know some Man United fans who rate him highly and, and some don't. Um, and, and that's fine. That's like most players. But I, if, I, if I was Oli Gunnar Solskjaer, I'd be looking at this and saying, well, Lukaku for me is the least likely of those three um, to pull me out, to pull me out the shit if I need it. And... I'd be looking for someone better to partner Rashford up front and find out quickly, you know, is this has this guy got a future here or not? Um, that brings us on to Maguire then. So, 
it's an awful lot of money. But then by the same token, the fee we're talking about for Lukaku is, is a lot higher than one would expect it to be as well. So it nets out a yeah. little bit. So what we're doing, if you look at the headline there, Maguire and Lukaku out, Manchester United are getting rid of a striker who's not that great and they've got players of equal talent already at the club and they are strengthening the position that's the weakest, which is centre-half. <clears throat> um, obviously, their defensive midfield needs, needs to look at as well. So they are strengthening the side with those two transfers there in terms of getting better balance and addressing the areas they need to. Again, Maguire but, is a... <sighs> go on. No, just... You, uh, Maguire for eighty million is just one of the most shocking. Yeah, it's, I mean, look, it's, I've heard it, in football ever. It, it's so. horrible, and it, no, it's horrible. And when you look at it and say, well, actually, we've spent one hundred and thirty million on Wan Bissaka and Maguire combined, you you know, you, you look at it and you just, you shake your head in disbelief. But we're at the point, unfortunately, where the money becomes irrelevant, doesn't it? Um, mm. And actually, they need a centre off. They've gone to the Premier League. Um, for whatever reason, they haven't bought Toby or Devireld. Maybe it's his age. Um, maybe maybe he doesn't want to go there. I don't know. But outside of that, if you think, you know, let's sign a, a, a centre-half who we know can play in the Premier League because he's already here. Um, you're looking at Harry Maguire and you're struggling for other realistic options. So they've gone out and got him. Um, but, Mag- but Toby or Devireld was um, valued at, what, 30 to 40? Yeah, well, Toby Alderweireld has got a 25 million release clause, which is why I don't understand it. You know, you'd at least try. Maybe they did. I, I, I don't know. But Tottenham would have had to have accepted it. <clears throat> um, why not buy Toby Alderweireld as well? You know, if you're, but if you're in... saying like Varane is going for 80 million or, um, I don't know, Koulibaly is going for 80 million or so I would understand. Or <coughs> someone like um, Harry, who's the one who plays for Milan, um, Romagnoli. Um, Someone like Romagnoli, yeah, but it's a completely yeah. different, it's Someone a completely like different market, yeah. isn't it? Harry because Maguire, you look at he scored one goal. You look England, at but well done. You look at Zaha. World Cup. You look at Wilfred Zaha. He's not worth eighty million pounds in a million years. But to Crystal Palace, if Crystal Palace get relegated, the cost of Crystal Palace is a lot more than the cost of Fiorentina of getting relegated from Serie A, where they'll get relegated, they'll get promoted from Serie B next season. They've lost about ten million pounds in revenue. Crystal Palace lose £100 million in revenue, they could be stuck in the Championship for five years. English clubs, to English clubs, the price is, price is massively inflated. And that's why when people complain, well, there's not a lot of English players getting a chance and people go abroad and buy weaker players, it, it's because of that. Um, but for Manchester United, you know, it's the positive is they are doing some business. They're trying to address their weak area, which is which is defence. Um, I'll struggle to find a Man United fan who disagrees that defensively they're in an appalling state. But like they're so bad at the back that even De Gea has been getting exposed, you know, over the last six months, and that's not a great place to be either. Um, you, you take Lukaku out, and someone like Bale or someone like um, who's the guy? Uh, is it Pepe from Lille that they want to sign? You you take that, but then I guess you're right. That doesn't sort of cure the actual problem, which is the. But surely they've got the funds to replace Lukaku with that money and still go and buy a centre back. Yeah, well, we're still ilk than Maguire. Yeah, I mean, they're still talking United about... Here, not like, you know, they, they're still talking about Fernandes, aren't they? But you're right, we are talking about Man United here, but in just four Fernandes or five years... Fernandes is another one, yeah. We, in four or five years, Man United have disintegrated defensively to a side that has, you know, two full-backs who are both wingers with a combined age of like, of age of like 75. You know, the, 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 the squad is in a state of disrepair um, and he's starting to rebuild it by bringing in young young defenders who are, you know, are Premier League ready. So I get what he's trying to do. It's risky. You look at the price, it's high. But, you know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is a Manchester United man. There's no doubt about that. He's got the best interest of the club at heart. And how long he's there for remains to be seen. But he's he's looking he's looking at younger players. He's looking at players who are ready to play now and learn while they're there. Um, and I think that's driven some of his business. Alavi, uh, we've kind of gathered your thoughts on uh, the, uh, Maguire, too much money, not the right man. Um, but we had a debate, didn't we, right at the start of last season when, uh, was it last season or the year before? No, two, Lukaku, two years ago, yeah. Yeah, when Lukaku joined United and I was saying that he wasn't a, a Manchester United quality striker. You kind of defended him a little bit, but you kind of got where I was coming from. Has his yeah, yeah. tenure at United proven that? Um. So DDL made the point that his, if you look at his statistics and his goal ratio, etc., 
it's not actually that bad. If I had to be completely honest and put ego aside and everything else, was he worth that money when we were arguing? No, you were probably right rather than myself on that one. All right, let's That's record that bit. Thing. We're going to record that bit. <laughs> you also said Salah would be a flop. So, um, you know, it <laughs> swings and roundabouts, right? I don't know so. what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but D, what DDL said is pertinent. Like, it, he's actual, there's a reason that he is not a man that's disliked by every Man United fan. There's a reason he's not liked by every Man United fan, but he divides opinion for a reason. He divides opinion because, just, uh, because he can do more than score. His goal scoring record is better than it, it looks, um, or it, it would appear to, to some that, you know, just see him miscontrol a ball and just presume that he doesn't get important goals because he does. But was he worth that much in that market? I think Man United was probably that one step up for him. He was probably more of a, a, a Spurs player. <laughs> Harry, what's your, th- <laughs> what's your thoughts on, on the headline below? Maguire in, Lukaku out. Would that be good business uh, in your view? Um, to be honest, I, I think that what's been said about Maguire's, I think the point made about um, Leicester and £80 million and, that, and, it, and, a player, and players being valued more by the club that they're at than their actual market value. As uh, somebody who's followed Newcastle, that's quite crucial because um, when you're when you're a team in the bottom half of the league, that you know it's important to get as much as you can out of these deals. So that, you know covers Zaha and it covers Maguire. But I think you have to look at it and think how much is a player worth in comparison to players who play in their position. Now, if, if Maguire goes to uh, to Manchester United for eighty million, he becomes the, the most expensive defender in the history of the world, and that's. That's just ridiculous to kind of say that. While as even if sort of um, you know Zaha goes to Arsenal for eighty or seventy, then he doesn't touch the money that Neymar went to PSG for. So the the, the going rate for a world class left winger is much more than the going rate for a world class centre half, um, and and that means that 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 you have to look at that in isolation and say it's probably not a great deal for Manchester. United. Having said that, it's a perfect. He's perfect for Man United. He's a, a, a decent. He's decent with the ball at his feet, and um, and he and he and he will d- undoubtedly make that team better. And I'm not sure there are many better options out there that Man United can, can feasibly get at this point in time. Uh, and that's probably why that's probably what they think and what they know. So that's probably why they're so keen to pay uh, to pay more money for him. In terms of Lukaku, I don't think he's a Solskjaer type of striker. I think he's you know. He's synonymous with the Mourinho era. Um, I think Solskjaer probably wants to go in a different direction. Um, from what I've seen of Solskjaer's Man United, they, they want to play um, counter-attacking football, but decent in possession as well. Somebody who who can play on the shoulder, but also is technically good enough to to have the ball at their feet and link play much better than Lukaku is would be ideal. So selling Lukaku is an obvious way of of moving on the style in that in that regard. Your str- I think your, your style is kind of defined more by your striker than it is more than uh, most positions on the pitch. So yeah. getting rid of Lukaku would be a good idea. Inter would be a perfect place for Lukaku, partly because Conte has, has, has loved Lukaku for so many years that that would just work perfectly. Um, Especially but, if Perisic goes the other way as well, because but, yeah, but, but I you're think getting that, a, a sort of player that Oli would like style-wise and probably a player that maybe... Conte would like style wise. So, if that might, I, I, I mean, personally, I think the the ship for, for Perisic has, has, has sailed. Um, but really? but I think specifically with with Lukaku that that works perfectly. But Inter's point of view, my United is just about giving getting as much as they can for him. Um, I'm yeah. not convinced that they should be looking for 75 million because he hasn't. He's I think he's a worse player now than he was when they bought him overall. Despite his record, as we pointed out, his record is very good or at least decent in, in everywhere he's been. Um, so he's a good player. I just I don't believe he's the style that my United want. I don't believe he's the level that my United want. Um, but equally, as has been said before, they're not where they where they believe they should be at the moment. So they can't go out and buy a player like Kylian Mbappe or Neymar, for example, like they could if they were as good as they were under Ferguson, for example. Yeah, um, that's some great points. So, great. so I think that... You need to look at. May I need to be quite realistic in a sense, but also, I think I wrote an article about this a couple of weeks ago where I said they could go for Ben Yedder from Sevilla, and 
having seen his weight right now, Ben Yedder is not an option that they should go for. But um, the style of, of striker, that's perfect because he's he can play on the shoulder. He's, he's brilliant with the ball at his feet. Um, he can score. He's, you know, he's a foreign goal scorer. But he isn't the the he doesn't have the perception of being a Manchester United level player. Um, but they shouldn't worry about the perception of, of they should they've worried too much about their perception for so many years. They should look at the ideal style and the ideal player to fit into what Solskjaer wants to do. That's exactly what Ferguson used to do for so many years. Um, so I think they they shouldn't worry about um, the perception and what people think of the players and what people and how people rate them. They should fit about think more about how they sit. How they fit in style wise, and Maguire fits them perfectly, Lukaku doesn't, so that would work perfectly, I think. Okay, great stuff. Quick comment before we move on from uh, Anthony Alfonso Lukaku should stay so we continue to watch Man United crumble. I agree with that, mate. Uh, it's not very nice, day, is it? All day long. Well, it's true, isn't it? Right, but we're going to move on to your team now, uh, DDL. Um, and as much as it pains me to say it, Spurs went all the way to the Champions League final last year. Uh, great season in the end. The league form suffered a little bit towards the end, but it didn't really matter, did it? Because you were buzzing about that Champions League final. Unfortunately for you, fortunately for the rest of the world, but unfortunately for you, you lost the Champions League final. But can Spurs next season go that one step further? And what I mean by that is, can they go on and win a major trophy with this man at the helm? Harry Kane scored a fantastic goal in that friendly against Juventus the other day. I'm sure you've all seen it on Twitter and all the, all the other social media platforms. But what needs to happen at Spurs, Dan, for, for it to go to that next level, for them to finally get a trophy and cap off, you know, what's been a brilliant job by Pochettino so far? Um, I, I'll answer the question in one word, right? Can Spurs go one step further? No. That For next season, can we go one step further? Can we win the Champions League instead of finishing second? No, we can't. Are we going to win the league next season? No, we're not. That's how I. That's how I feel. Looking at the competition, forget our own squad. There are going to be better teams than Tottenham in the Champions League, and there's going to be better teams than Tottenham in the Premier League title race. So, the second part of the question you asked was, well, can Spurs finally win a trophy? Um, Spurs winning the League Cup next season is not going a step further than where we are now. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of talk over the last four years about going to the next level. Spurs have managed to go to the next level without winning that trophy on the way. And it's it's weird. It's unusual. There's a load of reasons behind it. It could be something wrong with the players. It could be something wrong with the club. It could be something wrong with the fans. But for whatever it is, we've not been able to win the bit of silverware that everyone else seems to think we so badly need. Um, I think Tottenham have proved that you don't need that trophy to, to make the steps that we've made. So that's, that, that's my first point. Um, in terms of the squad, is the squad going to be able to go a step further than last year? So you mentioned how the league form dropped off there at the end of the season. That was a fundamental result of us not being deep enough to challenge on both fronts. It's as simple as that. We, you know, In February, we were three points away from going... Well, I think we were one win away from going second in the league, a point off Man City or two points off Man City, whatever it was. We lost that game... And then from that point on, ended up about 20 points adrift very quickly. We didn't have the depth to do it. So looking at the signing so far, there's one man's come in. But similar to Manchester United, it's addressing the area that is our biggest weakness, in my opinion. And we've got rid of our weakest player in Kieran Trippier, in my opinion, as well. So there's there's some positive steps there. Um, But we need to finish a job over the next three weeks. Um, Harry Kane... Who he, he's tapping uh, from fifty yards now as well, so that's a positive for us. Um, but Harry Kane needs some backup. <laughs> <clears throat> he, he needs some backup. He can't play. You know, he he he's having two ankle injuries a season now. You know, these things are going to persist. Mm. And you can watch Harry Kane play like you can watch most top strikers play, and you'll know after seventy minutes if their game is run. And between seventy minutes and ninety minutes, all they're doing is running around in circles quite frankly, um, not benefiting anyone, not benefiting themselves. We need to have a, a backup striker who we can trust to run to do a job. Um, we This is turned into a trademark, the Luca long answer, but, you know, in the Champions League final, forget the sky he, he didn't play in the, Did he play in the Champions League final? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Kane, um, I didn't see him anyway. 
Oh, I so, thought was being, I thought that was a serious <laughs> question. You look at the Champions League final, and there's a lot of them. Um, there's a lot of questions about whether he should have started or whether he shouldn't have started. But part of that is to do with the fact that, well, who do we trust to actually start a Champions League final in our squad up front? And the answer is there isn't anyone. You know, Lorente done a decent job in the end um, in the games he did have to play. But we need to have someone who we can trust, um, pick up the baton from him when he when he's tired, when he's struggling, when he's having a bad game. Because actually, you know, he, he's. He's, he's not a machine, you know, he, he has, he's going to have bad games, he's going to have injuries, he's not going to come back 100% fit. Um, so to take a step further in terms of challenging for two trophies at once, um, we, need, we need to finish the job in the next three weeks and get two more players in who are capable and trusted to play first-team football. OK. Uh, Alavi, what do you make of that? What, do you think that, do you agree with everything De Luca said or have you got a slightly different um, viewpoint on it? The, the thing is, Dan, if Kane, Kane's going to be your, your first choice striker, right? So which top striker is going to come knowing that they're probably not going to start most games? And that's the difficulty when you're a club like, no disrespect, but when you're a club like Spurs, you know, it's only the like Man Cities and even still like the Man United that just have the funds to just attract that tier of player who is maybe marginally below Kane and is happy just to sit sit on the bench. But it's wages, isn't it? It depends how much we pay. Do you know what I mean? It depends how much we pay. But you're not going to pay that. Like, okay, I'll tell you a player who you're linked with who would do well. Well, one of either... Sell, either um, who are you linked with? Sell off the bettest player? The Celso. Yeah. Jesus, how Abby's pronunciations get worse. No, no. Because Instead of getting up, wiser Sabalos, as he gets older. That's it. Sorry, sorry. He's Sabalos. coming to we're Arsenal, not, mate. We're, we're, not, we're not linked right. with Sabalos. We're right. not linked you with Sabalos. We've, we've are, never been linked with Sabalos. That's you nonsense. Are. There is you nonsense. Are. Trust me. Look it up. You've been nonsense. linked to him the last day. I'm not, okay. I'm not looking it up with like a third-rate English newspaper. Trust me. Okay. Tottenham, right. Tottenham Oscar is not interested The bettest player, right? The bettest player allows you, okay? The bettest player can sit with the other player you've bought and he allows Ali and Kane to push on and do the, jo- ca- to do the jobs that they should do. You could sign Danny Alves right back. You've got a new left back. So you start to put that team together. Why can't that team, why can't that team push to, to go and, and at least challenge for the title? Put that team I just said. Look, you've got the Tongan Sanchez and um, Toby or Devirald. I mean, that's back up defensively. It's a decent, it's what a decent I'm team. Is there is strength there. Like it's, but who's got a better team? In, but like bar, bar Man City and all right, probably Liverpool. Who? Why can't he challenge for the league? Who's better from out of Spurs than the rest? No one. What Chelsea? No, with Chelsea, have lost their best player. Haven't got a transfer. Haven't got. Can't buy anyone and have got to take get all their loan players back. Obviously, like don't even get me started on Arsenal. And you've got and you've got Man United who, you know, have still got Ashley. Ashley Young as a uh, you know, potential player. Like, see what I mean? Like, they have to be third Spurs, surely. They have to be challenging. Well, yeah, just but... interestingly, while you guys were, were debating that, I decided to look up, because, you know, we spoke about, I mentioned about Harry Kane missing games. I'm just going to share my screen on the screen now so you can see it. Um, Premier League made 28 appearances. So he missed 10 games in the Premier League. So it's quite a significant amount for someone else to come in and play, is it not? I mean, I don't see why people would be. Yeah, so... but that was one big injury. That was one big two. injury, wasn't it? Yeah, two injuries, didn't he? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Who, who? Who? Sorry. Who? Who? It's, this is like when Arsenal fans wanted to get rid of Wenger. Like, who? Who is this striker? Name me who they are. You, well, you, you, this is what I mean. You can sign anyone. We could sign anyone. Who, we, who's going to go? Yeah, I'll go and sit on the bench for ten games. But the whole point is, we could have, we could have, we could have signed, we could have signed Perez. He's gone to sit on the bench behind Vardy. We could, we could sign, you Great know, point. we could sign literally anyone. But it needs to be someone who can move and can offer something, as opposed to just a Plan B. It needs to be a Plan A as well. Lorente is a Plan B. If you, you know, you lose, he's a Plan E. He did all right, actually. He's got some, he's got some, some big, some big goals in the end there. But you know, in terms of his goals return, but the the point is. He, he's a plan B. We need someone who has the ability to plan A. You know, someone like, you know, Wilfred Zahar could play up front on his own if he had to do a job. If he had to shut a game down for, you know, 20 minutes, you could throw him up there, couldn't you? You know, there are players out there 
And in terms of us going a step further, which is the question, we need to have someone who can take the pressure off of Harry Kane's shoulders because he's going to get burnt out. And it's, he, I'll, I'll get... fall out for the better player, honestly, from what I've seen of him. He's, he's not a striker. Sure. Yeah. No, he, but he he will allow other players to play, and he's like a mercurial dribbler. He'll get on the ball. He'll he'll just confuse defenders, midfielders. They won't know who's who's meant to mark him, and he'll allow players like Ali to go to, to push further up front, like Son to push further up front. He's he does look to invest in. It does look like it does look like he'll be joining us. But like I said, we've yeah. got three we've got three weeks we need to finish the job. You know, to date we've only got one addition to the first team. If yeah. I could have if I could have picked one player to leave. It would have been Trippier. He's gone. That's great. If I could have picked one position to strengthen, it would have been, uh, you know, central midfield. We brought in Ndombele. That's great as well. But, you know, to, to go one step further and challenge for both the Premier League and the Champions League simultaneously, we need to finish a job. The League Cup, if we win the League Cup or the FA Cup, yeah, I'll celebrate. But we've, we've passed that. We've missed that phase out. We, we've leapfrogged it. Yeah. Not picking up, not picking up a trophy on the way is something for our rivals to beat us with. But the reality is, we we've progressed without doing it. Um, well, and we'll, how much is Celos oh, yeah, being no valued at? Because how much is Celos being valued at? Because the thing with Spurs is you never know if if that if they go and buy him. Well, that's think, Daniel Levy going. I think here we Real are, Betis. I think Real Betis it's have a, a uh, about to sign. They? I think they're about to sign Nabil. For, uh, is it Nabil Fakir from Yeah, Leon? Nabil Fakir. Uh, Okay, yeah, yeah. Can't so you pronounce stuff, Harry? That would suggest no. I forgot the name. Not that I can't pronounce it. You've said he's, <laughs> you've said this Betis player's name four times, and you've got it wrong right every time. Now his name is Celos, apparently. Okay, uh, get mixed with Sabalos. Jesus Christ! <laughs> right, just let, we're coming towards the end of the show. We're almost running out of time. I just want to get um, Harry the Cosmos' thoughts on one more topic, uh, and that is regarding my team, Arsenal. Now, I wasn't going to put this in the show, um, but this has happened sort of this evening and it's quite big news. Arsenal have had another bid rejected for Wilfred Zaha. This time it's reportedly uh, 55-odd million pounds plus Reese Nelson uh, on a year's loan, plus another 10 million uh, in bonuses, apparently. So it would total up to 65 million plus Reese Nelson on loan for the season. Harry, we were talking about players being worth what they're worth to their clubs but have crystal palace gone a little bit overboard here in a sense i mean there is there you can't convince me that wilfred zaha is at all worth 80 million pounds unless you're a crystal palace fan because you think about what the crystal palace will lose when they lose zaha they'll pretty much well you'll pretty much lose your entire goal threat basically you know you'll lose that sort of ability to win penalties that i've never seen before in the Premier League, it, 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 it's, it's something else. I think uh, Arsenal got Arsenal got enough of that, to be fair. But, but, <laughs> yeah, that's all they need. But if you <laughs> another ref for an ideal player that that, that that Arsenal needs, Zaha would be fantastic. He's pacey, he's direct, he's everything that Arsenal. I think Arsenal miss. Um, they have a lot of like creative players who can cut inside, like Victoria and Ozil and stuff like that. But they don't have any uh, enough players that can break the lines like Zaha can. Having said that, I think there are plenty of players out there uh, like uh, Pepe, like um, Leon Bailey from uh, Bayer Leverkusen, who might might get you might get for cheaper that, that, that would do as uh, they would do a similar job. So I think I would, if I was Arsenal, I wouldn't touch uh, Wilfred Zaha at uh, eighty million pounds, despite what I said about him being the ideal kind of player, because uh, simply because there are there are uh, different options out there. But if I was Crystal Palace. Um, yeah, I would be trying to milk this deal for all you can get, not just because he's the best player, but I think the difference between Zaha and literally almost any other player uh, that's that, that for any other club, you know, like as much as I as much as I've rated Ayose Perez, um, Newcastle can go out and buy a, a player who can do a similar job. I don't think Crystal Palace will find anybody who can do anything near what what Wilfred Zaha has done at Crystal Palace. So if I was Palace, I would. I would be, you know, I can understand it from completely from both sides' point of view. And if I was Arsenal, if you know, if you can't get a, you can't get them down to sort of 60, 65 million pounds, uh, you know, as a cash deal, maybe uh, as a last resort, go and look for somebody like Leon Bailey, like Pepe, who's reportedly available at seventy million, um, and and would do as as good a job uh, as uh, I, I think. To be honest, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, my take on it is it's an absolutely ridiculous bid. And considering all summer we've heard about the fact that Arsenal are strapped for cash to now, now yeah, that they're going out and, you know, sort of looking to bring in Zaha for that sort of money is absolutely crazy. Especially when you consider that last season, Arsenal scored more goals in the Premier League than both Spurs and Chelsea. Meaning our problems are not in that end of the pitch. I don't understand why Arsenal, if they do have sort of extra money available from what we were originally told are not going out there and trying to reinforce at the back. That is the, the most important part uh, of this Arsenal team that needs addressing. And it feels like as a fan, it's really, really frustrating to hear that, you know, on the one hand, you're pleased that we're looking to bring in players for that sort of money. But on the other hand, it's a little bit worrying that the people in charge of the money deem Wilfred Zaha more important than uh, strengthening defence fancy. I mean, I don't know. Just finally, guys, as well, just to wrap it up, because we've had, uh, we've gone over our time and we've had a quick question come in uh, via Facebook Messenger. So I can't put it uh, on the screen, unfortunately, but it comes in from Jack. And his question is in regards to Frank Lampard. I'm going to put this one to you first, Alavi. Frank Lampard has taken over at Chelsea. What can we expect from him this season, in your opinion? Uh, I just, I cannot see Chelsea getting in the top three at all. Um, like I said earlier, they've lost their best player. They've lost... They they, they can't sign anyone. They, they're going to have to call on, you know, pick players like Loftus-Cheek. You're, you know, you're talking about a manager who has... And it goes back to what Harry De Cosmo said right at the start of the show. Like, you talk about a manager who's just got there on something that is an actual quality. I know he did a good job at um, Derby, but he's just got there because he's a legend and it, you know it's the same way Bruce has got it because he's 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 from there it just it just doesn't sit well um I know I predicted Chelsea do well this season but I just I, ca I cannot see them getting I, I think they'll be lucky to get in the, the the top four I really do okay interesting uh DeLuca your take on, take on the Frank Lampard thing uh will he be a success at Chelsea in your opinion um I think I think he's in a struggle this year. I think he's going to be a good manager. I think the only thing in Lampard's favour is things at Chelsea seem to be changing a little bit. Um, Abramovich seems to be calling off. Appointing Lampard is a completely different strategy to everything else they've ever done. And I think he might get two seasons. Um, and maybe in the second season, he'll be able to save himself. But it's a big risk for him. And I didn't think he needed to take it. I think he's, um, I think his eyes are bigger than his belly with this one. And he, he should have spent He got Di Matteo, didn't he? That's not completely different to what he's well, done. But well, Dimit Dimitar was a caretaker manager, wasn't he? And then he won the Champions League. Yeah. So they, they couldn't really then sack him. But they did as soon as they could after that. Um, <laughs> so, so I, you know, I think Lampard would have been well well versed to wait another year with Derby. Um, but I think it will work out in the end, just not next season. You can't okay. really blame him for taking it. No, of course no, not. Can't. I, I can't blame him. But <laughs> I, I've got him in the I've got him in the category of actually sensible football man and that's why I think he'll make a good manager but um, mm. I thought he'd be sensible enough to turn this one down um, but maybe he thought the chance wouldn't come around again yeah, yeah. that's a fair point uh, Harry your thoughts finally on Frank Lampard I agree with um, with everything that's been said really um, Lampard wouldn't be in the position where he is with Chelsea if he wasn't Frank Lampard you know super super Frankie Lampard at Chelsea um, I think but I think there is one thing that people haven't really touched upon is whether he was right, you know, whether he saw an opportunity to leave Derby at the right time, not necessarily to go to Chelsea, but to leave Derby at the right time, because Derby are in a situation where they sort of like, they didn't have that much money to spend last season in the championship. They demand promotion pretty much every year. They just can't get it. Um, and they were, and they sort of had to, you know, Lampard kind of had to sort of work on his feet a little bit to get them where, they, where he got them with loans and things, which were to do with his links with Chelsea, obviously with Mount. And uh, Tamori, but you know, the the, the owner I think uh, sold sold the stadium and leased it back to him, which you can only do once um, to get to fund last season. You can't do that again. Um, and obviously, with, with more and more parachute playing clubs coming down, he might have looked at Derby and gone, "This is you know maybe I've taken Derby as far as I can in one year." That doesn't necessarily mean he was right to take the Chelsea job. Um, in terms of Chelsea, I think the 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 transfer ban might work in their favour because they'll be able to, you know, see if like Tammy Abraham 
or Ruben Loftus Cheek are good enough because this is the constant thing with Chelsea is no one no, no one ever gets a run in the team long enough to actually see if they can actually do the job. They're just replaced by somebody who's uh, you know costs more and has a bigger name and things like that, which is a, a, an issue that I think a lot of clubs, when I think about it, may not have mentioned before. Um, you know things these clubs need to stop looking at you know perception and start looking at actual fit, and th that might work because Lampard is sensible enough. I agree with, with De Luca in terms of his his intelligence and his managerial style. He's probably the right man in terms of in, in that sense. It's far too early for him, though. Um, I don't, you know, I think it's far too big of a risk for him, and um, I don't think he'll make any inroads on the title race. I think the best they can hope for is fourth place this year. Um, yeah. but, but but there's no precedent to suggest that this ends well for him. There's no there's no there's no way. That there's no one who's previously survived more, you know, other than Mourinho in his first spell, and that ended in tears, um, that suggests that he's going to have a long period of success at Chelsea. And that is the worst thing that, that can happen to Frank Lampard, is that he do, it, it does end in tears for him at Chelsea, because it, it, it might not taint his legacy completely, but he won't, he'll no longer be super Frankie Lampard, the great goal scorer in the fielder. He'll be super yeah. Frankie Lampard, the great goal scorer in the fielder, and the pretty rubbish manager. And that's, you know, kind of what Shearer was Shira. in a sense, yeah. Because, um, you know, it didn't, you know, with Newcastle and Shearer, you can cover it up by Mike Ashley. But if you actually analyse what Shearer did at Newcastle in those eight games, he didn't do a lot. And there's nobody who's calling for Shearer to be manager anymore. And um, and I think the risk of it is even bigger for Chelsea at Lampard if it goes wrong. But having said that, immediately, in the immediate future, I think he'll do okay. But I just don't see a long-term successful plan. I don't, I don't know how this ends well for him eventually, because I think eventually he will be... He'll be sacked rather than go. He's not going to go and leave for a better job. See what I mean? So, to be honest, I don't see how this ends well for him in the long run. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a myth that Newcastle were going down, isn't it? Like, it's this myth that's put <laughs> over time that Newcastle were going down and Shearer just, you know, did the best of what he's good. They actually weren't in a bad position. Like, they could have survived. The, the club went down, but Shearer didn't do enough tactically in the games. Yeah. You know, yeah. he did. He, he was so. He, it, it was just assumed that Shearer's sheer force of personality would come in and save the club. And once after the first game, when it was quite clear that that wasn't going to happen, um, that you know th there was a couple of games. I think he won against Middlesbrough, and that was the game that everyone thought he was going to survive. He lost against Fulham in the next game, and that's the problem that Matt, that uh, Frank Lampard is going to have. Is if his sheer force of personality isn't enough to get off to a good start, then suddenly people will start looking at it and think. And thinking as a, of him as a manager rather than as a legend in the manager's hot seat. It's like Solskjaer the other way around, right? Like Solskjaer got off to a really yeah. good start and bought himself time. Like a legend needs to do that. Sorry, Harry. No, you, you, you wrap up. That's all right. That's all right. Great discussion as always, guys. Uh, big thank you to every single one of you for coming on. Uh, big thanks to everybody who's watched us live, whether it's, whether it's Facebook, on YouTube, or on Twitter via Periscope. Uh, big thanks to every single one of you for your comments, uh, for your participation in this evening's show. Um, you'll have to bear with us for a couple of weeks. We're using some new software. Um, I think we navigated it quite well, actually, tonight, considering it was the first time. But it will only get better. Um, so fingers crossed uh, you'll enjoy the videos more going forward. This show will be available to download as a podcast from tomorrow morning. So big hello to those of you listening to us on the replay as well. And uh, we'll be back next week with another Premier League review show. Or well, it's not really a review show, is it? Because the season eight started. But a Premier League show brought to you by Sofa Sports Media. Until next week, take care.